Welcome to How to Live Like Shakespeare, Colloquies in Renaissance Wisdom. This series is a collaboration between the New Swan Shakespeare Center at UC Irvine and the Shakespeare Workshop at UC Santa Cruz. And your two hosts, Sean Kylan and Julia Lupton, have been friends and collaborators for many years. And we found ourselves approaching similar questions in our teaching and research around Shakespeare's relationship to wisdom and wisdom literature, and what we can learn from Shakespeare by listening in on his own thinking, reasoning, wondering, deliberative, composing process. We're really interested in how ideas around virtues and the good life are derived from ancient philosophy, derived from scripture, also resonate with global wisdom traditions that Shakespeare would not have known directly, and how this resonance between his thinking and wisdom traditions that are quite diverse in terms of their geographical and historical spread can also resonate with us today in our own lives as we use reading and imagination and conversation to try to fashion a way, uh, to fashion ourselves, uh, to fashion communities. So I'm really, really happy to be embarking on this project with my friend, Sean Kylan. Sean, do you wanna say a few words about what we're trying to do? Yes, I do. Um, as someone who works in a university, as someone who thinks a lot about the condition of the humanities as we know them as intellectual disciplines, I'm struck by the fact that um, while we've made great strides in producing knowledge in the humanities, we have, to a certain extent, lost sight of their original function, which, as Julia was just saying, was the contemplation of wisdom. And uh, through that contemplation, the transformation of perspective and behavior. Um, I think of this series as uh, a way of testing the viability of an old idea about the humanities and about the literary and cultural works on which they rest. At the end of the 19th century, a British writer called uh, Matthew Arnold uh, was acutely aware of the inroads that uh, advances in the natural sciences, the empirical sciences, were making against religion as a point of reference for human behavior. Matthew Arnold suggested, argued vociferously, in fact, that poetry might be able to take religion's place as a resource for human development and human self-reflection. Here, I'll read a little passage to you. Um, Arnold said in an essay called The Study of Poetry, there is not a creed which is not shaken, not an accredited dogma which is not shown to be questionable, not a received tradition which does not threaten to dissolve. And there he's speaking specifically about advancements in biology and in geology that were disproving the possibility that um, the Christian Bible could be literally true about all things. On the other hand, Arnold said, the future of poetry is immense because in poetry, when it is worthy of its high destinies, our race, as time goes on, will find an ever surer and surer way. So that's a big claim for what he's calling poetry, by which I think he means generally human art and culture. I think our series is going to explore the possibility that Shakespeare, as one very fine example of human art and culture, can provide for us the um, set of bearings that uh, European culture, European and American culture prior to the uh, 20th century took for granted in religion. Now, that's not to say that we think that Shakespeare has a doctrine or a manifesto or a Jeremiah or an apology or anything like that. We're keen to present him uh, to you as a resource that you will have to fit uh, to your own lives or not. You are as much co-creators of this series as we are. We're drawing your attention to passages but we're also hoping that you will tell us what these passages mean to you in relation to your own experience. And so each week we're going to be looking at a passage from a play and we're going to be doing close reading 
We're also going to look at some of the sources in philosophy, in scripture, in ritual exercises, in other poets that Shakespeare is drawing on as he thinks his way through some of the virtues, capacities, and faculties that help make the human condition both the challenge and the promise that it is. So we're going to get started. This is our first concept, right? We're going to be sharing a concept each week that is related to a beloved passage of Shakespeare. And we thought that the imagination was a really good place to start uh, in this famous speech from Midsummer Night's Dream, um, because of course, imagination has become such a key term for thinking about art and the creative process. But imagination is also a part of spiritual exercise and many traditional paths towards wisdom around the world. And we can see the stirrings of those modern senses of imagination in the speech jostling against other more ancient meanings of the idea. And we also wanted to start with an early play by Shakespeare. We wanted to be able to really listen in to Shakespeare thinking about his own creative processes while he was still very much learning about his craft, he was exploring his own capacities. So what I'm going to be doing is taking this, this speech apart, uh, section by section. This is what we call close reading in English studies. Uh, we'll talk about their meanings. We'll also connect to some of the sources that Shakespeare might have had in mind in, in composing this speech. That we'll discuss, and if we have time, we'll look at it performed by the Globe Theater in London. So where are we at this point in the play, right? This is the top of Act Five, and Hippolyta, Queen of the Amazons, and Theseus, Duke of Athens, enter discussing what the young lovers have told them about what they remember from their weird and wacky night in the forest, right? And everybody is going to get married. They're presiding over the wedding ceremony during act five. And the speech actually begins with Hippolyta. She says, she frames it, she introduces it, right? She kind of gives him the writing prompt. She says, "'Tis strange, my Theseus, what these lovers speak of." And Theseus responds, more strange than true. I never believe these antique fables, nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. So one of the first things to notice about this speech is that Theseus is skeptical, right? And who is Theseus? He's the legendary founder of Athens, which is the birthplace of philosophy and logic. So we might say that he trends a bit more STEM than arts. And he refers to the young people's stories of the night as antique fables. And antique has a sense of ancient, right? This is a play that draws very much on classical mythology and folklore, but ancient also could mean antic or crazy. He calls these stories fairy toys. And toys was a less friendly word in 1595, 1596, and it is now. It may be related to a word for cobweb, and it has the sense of insubstantial or frivolous, and it could be used for jests, jokes, and puns. Theseus in these opening lines is beginning to build the key comparison of his speech. Lovers are like madmen. Why? Because their brains seethe, right? Their brains are hot. They bubble and foam with too much ideation, right? Why? Why do they seethe? Because they're heated up by passion, right? So the contrast here is with the coolness of reason, right? Which slows down the movement of thought by putting passion at bay and allowing for judgment and deliberation. Shaping fantasies, right? This is a key phrase in the speech. Fantasy 
refers here to the imagination as a faculty or capacity. In medieval and Renaissance psychology, the imagination is that part of the brain which manages a vast array of mental images, which it pulls from memory, which it aligns with the data coming in from sense perception, and can also make or shape new images like fairies or minotaurs by combining images together. Now, what about apprehension and comprehension? These are words that are really coming from, again, psychology. There's something learned and even academic about the vocabulary that Theseus uses. What is apprehension and comprehension? Well, I see apprehension as a kind of a big net, right, that drags everything in, right? The fish, the seaweed, the plastic bags, and the abandoned water bottles. Everything is vermished. Comprehension is a fine sieve, right, which carefully sorts out what the mind should retain in value and what it should discard. But there's no comprehension without apprehension. Right? And the great Muslim, Jewish, and Christian philosophers of the Middle Ages agreed that the soul understands nothing without images. Right, Imagination is the beginning of understanding. Then Theseus develops the central segment of his speech. He says, the lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. The madman, the lover, all as frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. So the madman sees devils, and those are hallucinations, and we can understand how those come from the imagination. The lover makes a different kind of error, right? The lover idealizes his beloved, giving a brow of Egypt the quality of a Helen, right? And we have some racialized language here, right? Helen stands for fair or white, and brow of Egypt for black or darker. According to Theseus, the lover makes the error of seeing black as beautiful. He may be thinking of Hippolyta herself, right? who as Sean pointed out to me last night, as an Amazon queen comes from a different race and may be one of Shakespeare's many dark ladies. Shakespeare may also have in mind here Cleopatra, right? The brow of Egypt, who will get her own play about 10 years later. Now the equation of the lover, the lunatic and the poet is negative for Theseus, right? By calling them mad, he's dismissing the young lover's stories. But it's really interesting that this equation is neither original to Shakespeare, nor is it always negative. The ultimate source of it may be Plato, but we can turn to a work that we know Shakespeare was reading when he wrote this play, The Praise of Folly, by Erasmus. And I've gotten really interested this year in Erasmus as a potential model and source for Shakespeare's engagement with wisdom and with wisdom literature. This is a satiric pamphlet, wildly popular in the 16th century, delivered in the voice of a woman named Folly, who makes fun of almost everyone and everything. Towards the end of the pamphlet, Erasmus gets a little bit more serious, and he talks about good kinds of folly, the forms of folly that might actually enhance wisdom. And it's in this section that he cites Plato. He says, Plato wrote that the madness of lovers is the height of felicity. Felicity is happiness. For one who loves passionately no longer lives in himself, but in the object of his love. Okay, so this is what we call platonic love, <laughs> right? Now, usually when we talk about platonic love, we mean love that isn't sexual, right? A deep love between really, really close friends. 
But for Plato, this divine love has to do with, with climbing the ladder of truth towards ideas, eventually leaving this world for a higher order of reality. And we can see this quest for the truth written into the very word philosophy, which means the love, philo, of wisdom, Sophia, right? It has this element of passion and eros in it. To love wisdom is to pursue it actively, to yearn for it, to be on a quest, right? And that sense of quest and that sense of love is a really important part of wisdom and wisdom literature. So although Theseus is dismissing the lovers as lunatics, I think we're starting to hear Shakespeare in these lines thinking through and beyond Theseus, right? As he warms up, he's starting to write in his own voice or at least in his own head, right? He's, he's seeing where these ideas take him, right? Ideas with a little I, ideation, the stream of consciousness, but also ideas with a big I, right? Truth a higher reality. And it's moments like this that really, really interest us in this series. We're interested in moments in Shakespeare that begin as dramatic monologues, that belong fully to a character in a play, but they start becoming something else, right? They start becoming independent thought. And that's independent thought in conversation with other independent thinkers like Plato, or Erasmus, right? And this impulse towards independent thought really takes off when? Well, when Shakespeare tar starts talking about poetry, about writing. So what does he say about the poet? He describes the poet, the poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling, right? Like imagine someone having a seizure or being in a fit, glancing from heaven to earth and from earth to heaven. So this, this is that platonic poet that we saw described by Erasmus, right? In a state of rapture outside himself, caught up in cosmic truths that span the heavens and the earth. What, what poets might Shakespeare have in mind here? Well, he may be thinking about Orpheus, right, the mythic poet who wrote hymns to the gods and who descended to the underworld, had a cosmic journey in search for whom? For his beloved, right, his, his dead wife Eurydice. And, and that sounds an awful lot like another poet, <laughs> right, the poet Dante, who also traveled through the cosmos and was guided by his beloved, right, the beautiful dead Beatrice. And I also hear perhaps elements of the image of woman wisdom from the book of Proverbs, right? And the poets who composed the Bible. I love the fact that in this passage, which for me is very emblematic of our project in this series, that wisdom speaks in her own voice as a woman. And she says that she was with God at the creation of the world and is always his delight. Amazing. So what do Plato, Orpheus, Dante, and woman wisdom from Proverbs have in common? Well, they link creation, cosmic, with creativity, poetic, and imaginative. They infuse creativity with a sense of love, of eros, of passion. They, they acknowledge a feminine principle within creativity. They see creativity perhaps as a, a dialogue between the masculine and the feminine, between Hippolyta and Theseus or Titania and Oberon. And we also have a sense of, of spiritual exercise of imagination being in the service of a quest for wisdom, but a form of spiritual exercise that is open to play, to enjoyment, to delight. 
So let's return to our passage from Shakespeare, fortified by this journey into ancient wisdom. Shakespeare says that imagination bodies forth the form of things unknown. Wow, that's interesting because he doesn't say that poets simply make things up, right? Create phantasms or lies. Instead, the imagination seems to be a way of knowing, right? The poet reaches towards what is unknown and gives form to it. Think of, let's say the Greek gods giving form to love and war, um, or the fairies in Shakespeare's forest giving form to our sense that nature is filled with hidden energies. Or think of the figure of woman wisdom in Proverbs, right? Giving form to the sense that that God's creative capacities are interpersonal, that his creative capacities involve some kind of dialogue and incorporate a feminine principle. These forms of things unknown are more than bare outlines, right? The imagination, Shakespeare says, bodies them forth, right? They have a dimensionality and a life of their own. They move in space and time. Indeed, the poet gives them a local habitation and a name, right? He creates characters with personalities and he places them in settings that we recognize by giving this moving form to inchoate ideas, we get a, we get a handle on them, right? We get a way to start addressing them in our own lives. Maybe their presence changes how we walk through the forest or the park. Or maybe they help us consider why the impulse to aggression or anger can be so overpowering. Or maybe they invite us to consider the cosmos in a manner that speaks to our best and worst selves. What about airy nothing? Theseus, the character, is being dismissive, but Shakespeare, the poet, I think, is talking about the way in which ideas exist in a different way, right? They exist on a different plane than living bodies and, and other material things. It's precisely because ideas are airy nothings that they survive their creators, right? That's why Shakespeare can be in dialogue with Plato and Erasmus, and we can be in dialogue with Shakespeare. So let's kind of ask our question about Shakespeare and wisdom and, and ask what does Shakespeare contribute to wisdom literature? Silence my phone here, sorry about that. Um, and I wanna do that by talking about imagination in our modern sense right, where imagination often means self-realization through self-expression. And this is sometimes, you know, in our educational philosophies embodied in the expression, follow your passion, right? Follow your dream, see where your passion takes you. And that's not exactly how the ancient tradition understood imagination, right? We see in Theseus, but he's very much thinking about imagination as a part of a cognitive ensemble, right? Imagination in relationship to memory and to reason and to passion and to judgment. We saw in Plato and Erasmus how imagination is part of a spiritual exercise, as part of a search for things of ultimate value. And we know that imagination is part of guided meditation and prayer traditions around the world. The ancients would not be comfortable with the expression, follow your passion, right? They would wanna say, follow wisdom, pursue wisdom, but integrate imagination and passion into that journey. The young people in a Midsummer Night's Dream do follow their passions into the forest. Right, and they, lots of amazing things happen to them while they follow their passion. When they come out of the forest, 
they need to start sorting things out. They need to start balancing imagination and passion with reason and judgment. And maybe, just maybe, they'll consider pursuing wisdom. At least that's where the speech is taking me right now. Now the speech has a, a coda, continues with a wonderful bit on the bear and the bush, but I wanna make sure that Hippolyta has a chance to respond to Theseus. And I'm wondering whether Sean has any thoughts about Hippolyta's response before we open this up to the rest of you. Yeah, I'd say two things about this just very briefly. The first is that when um, Hippolyta responds to Theseus's speech, um, she uses that word strange again, strange and admirable, which is where she started the conversation, right? To strange my Theseus that these lovers speak of. And I think internal to the logic of the play and to the evolving relationship between Hippolyta, who is a captive war bride, and Theseus, her conquering husband, um, she is reminding him that he's perhaps not listening to what she said, or she, he's not having the conversation that she just invited him to have. She's asked him to think about uh, what the lovers have said about their experience in the forest, or to share his own experience of what they've said. And he's responded somewhat obliquely, not completely off course, but somewhat obliquely with this little lecture about the imagination and how it works. And so I think she's partly recalling him to the conversation that she wanted to have with him and asking whether um, you know, he has heard her, whether he, whether he sees her. I also think her um, response that Julia has up on the screen now really um, throws back upon the audience of the play or upon readers of the play um, the problem of imagining what's just happened or what the status of what's just happened is in the audience's own imagination, right? She is um, referring to the lovers as a group of people who have undergone some strange transformative experience and come out the other side of it with different points of view about what happened, but nevertheless sharing in something of great, right? They've all been changed. They all have different perspectives on what has happened to change them, but they have somehow uh, wound up um, in the presence of, or sharing something of great constancy, something that is unchanging. Um, and I, I, I just, as I was responding to uh, Andre Nu's point in the chat, this, this speech, this exchange could only have happened in Midsummer Night's Dream, which is constantly asking the audience whether it can believe uh, what it sees and what it hears as the truth. And that's the other question I think that's being raised here by this exchange between the two of them. Um, what actually is true in the theater? Um, if, if you believe that something happened, what happened, right? And um, in what sense could you make the truth of what happened the basis of understanding, interpretation, behavior, relationships, and so on and so forth? Beautiful. I'm going to stop sharing so that we, I can see more of our guests. And I think Sean is going to moderate some questions before we watch our clip. Uh, yeah, so if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, you can see some of the discussion that's been going on there already. Um, here, here's a question from my friend in Santa Cruz, Filippo John Ferrari, who is a Dantista, so watch out. Um, what about the Christian medieval tradition of warning against the deceiving power of imagination uh, that creates ghosts that originate in sensual perceptions? How would you integrate this tradition with your very powerful reading of this passage from Midsummer Night's Dream? Well, I think Theseus is, you know, accommodating that when he talks about madmen and their hallucinations. And so I think um, there is a sense here of imagination uh, being powerful, being potentially dangerous, being acknowledged in its, um, its negative roles. And Theseus is voicing that, especially at the beginning of the speech. And again, my sense is that as, as Theseus 
expounds this more negative doctrine of the imagination, Shakespeare starts separating from Theseus or starts voicing his own thoughts through Theseus. And that middle part of the speech uh, is starting to vocalize a more positive view of what the imagination can offer. But all of that is still within a Theseian framework um, that I think still belongs you know, to a kind of long Middle Ages. Um, so I think that's a great, a great question. And you know, it's interesting that I think that Shakespeare does have something like the Dantean model of the poet in mind as he begins counter arguing <laughs> with Theseus about this. And when we performed this play last summer, Eli Simon directed a great uh, midsummer night Zoom. One of the things which Eli did is he broke the speech up and he divided it almost equally between Theseus and Hippolyta. And that made it more interesting to listen to, especially on Zoom. So I think there was a kind of technical reason to make that decision. But I found it really profound from a hermeneutic point of view, uh, because I think Shakespeare is, like, like Shakespeare does in his sonnets, I think Shakespeare is having a dialogue with himself about the imagination and sharing the speech out between the more rationalist Theseus and the more, let's say, imaginative Hippolyta is very true to the rhythm and movement of thought um, that we see in the speech itself. Um, Christy and Lou Marlin are asking, uh, what do we know about Shakespeare actually being influenced by contemporary authors and integrating their view of philosophy and imagination in his work? In other words, maybe what did he read or what would he have been okay. exposed to in his formal education? Well, I mean, Sean, you're really the expert on Shakespeare and the classics. Uh, you know, you've written <laughs> several books <laughs> on the topic of, of Shakespeare's classical world. But, you know, we know that he... Uh, would have been familiar with Cicero. Uh, he would have been, of course, familiar with Erasmus, who I brought in. Uh, he probably would have read the psychological writings of Thomas Wright, who was doing a kind of advanced Aristotelian faculty psychology. Uh, he was not an academic. He didn't go to college. He didn't go to university, unlike other um, other major playwrights of the period. Uh, but we know that he was, that he read widely and that he also probably talked about a lot of things with people. Um, so, you know, there'd be quite a few places where he would go to uh, for some of these ideas about the imagination. And not least of those in, in an immediate vernacular context would be Sir Philip Sidney's defense or apology for poetry, right? In which um, that, that was out in the mid 1580s uh, and high, very popular. Um, and it offers an account uh, very much like the account that Julia just uh, gave about the, um, uh, the poet's work in relation to the work of creation in general, right? I think it's reasonable that he um, is picking up some of his, some of the theory in Theseus's lecture from, from that, that place. And this, this speech is sometimes called Shakespeare's defense of poetry, running parallel to Sidney's uh, defense of poetry. So that's beautiful. And, and since Julia mentioned the classics, I'd also say that, um, you know, a text that Shakespeare doubtless encountered in grammar school and was available in an English translation, and that he returns to constantly from one end of his career to another is Ovid's Metamorphoses. So that's a Roman epic of sorts in, in which you might argue that um, artists are the epic hero. I mean, it's um, some 250 myths about the origin of things, right? It, it, it offers itself as what's called an etiology, a, a series of um, origin stories. But in each episode, someone, usually a god, but not always, changes something into something else so that it's more conformable to the changer's imagination, right? 
Uh, so uh, that I think that's an important context too, and I, I imagine that Ovid will crop up in subsequent presentations. Um, but Ovid for Shakespeare um, is a repertoire of scenes in which someone imposes his or her imagination on usually on someone else in order to make um, that formerly sentient being part of a world that is more appealing to the uh, person who's reimagined it in these terms. Yeah, I just want to add to sort of one of our goals in, in hosting these conversations is to kind of build out, to really focus in on these individual passages, but in the process, build out Shakespeare's reading list. And that's why I brought the Erasmus text in today, and I might be referring to Erasmus again. And so that's something that we'll try to do each week, assuming that you guys find that interesting, um, to bring in some of these texts. And then maybe you'd be interested in reading the Praise of Folly or reading the metamor rereading the Metamorphoses or you know, returning to some of these works. And, and for those of you who are interested in um, exploring Shakespeare's you know, voracious wide reading, uh, there's an excellent uh, reference tool uh, called Shakespeare's Books. It's a sort of short encyclopedia by Stuart Gillespie. I think you can see that there. Um, and it's just a finding aid. Uh, it, it lays out what uh, Stuart Gillespie takes to be um, all of the books that uh, surface in one way or another in Shakespeare's plays and what editions he might have known them in. And uh, it's not much more than that, but it's an extremely useful tool for getting a sense of the um, library out of which the worldview of his plays seems to have emerged. Further thoughts about this passage or Julia's presentation? Shauna Peterson says, Shakespeare is said to foreshadow the present in his work. Uh, Midsummer talks of imagination as an additive element in reality. Does this foreshadow what we now promote? That is to say a team made up of different backgrounds and areas of study double majors of two very different <laughs> subjects, et cetera. Hmm, good question. I like that. I mean, clearly theater was a collaborative project. And so although this, this particular series is in some ways focusing on Shakespeare as reader and writer rather than Shakespeare as theater maker, which we emphasize in other community programming that we do, <laughs> um, they, they're not, it's the same man, right, engaged in these activities. But I think that even the reading and writing part is also collaborative, right? And that's why I tried to give a little short reading of the airy nothing as the life of the idea um, and the way in which ideas live through books, are transmitted through reading and writing and conversation, including colloquia like this one, um, because writing itself is always a tissue of ideas and references and allusions and memories and repressions and yearnings in relationship to other texts. And again, that's part of our interest here is in each day bringing in, you know, some of the authors, some of the ideas that Shakespeare is interacting with in this creative way that he is. So um, two really good comments were just made and we're coming close to the hour. So I'll just, I'll start with Ariane's and go back to Kathleen B's. So um, Ariane is asking um, whether uh, uh, in the background here is also a text called Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy, um, which is you know, an extraordinary performance of the imagination in relation to uh, dire, the dire circumstances of the author in prison awaiting execution. Ariane, I'll be talking a little bit about Boethius week in relation to the passage from Richard II that we'll be looking at. So I'll sort of table that for a moment unless Julia has something she wants to say about it. Well, I'm just very interested in this female wisdom. You know, obviously I'm biased as a female person, <laughs> but 
I got very excited reading Proverbs with my graduate students this winter and sort of delving into some comparative religion and some of the Near Eastern and Egyptian sources for Lady Wisdom and then thinking about that in terms of Cleopatra and in terms of uh, so many of, of Shakespeare's heroines are in fact the wise ones. They're more knowing, they're more deliberative, um, they have sort of depths of, of experience that sometimes surprises us. Um, and so I'm very interested in that aspect of Lady Wisdom. And she's a little bit of a muse for me coming into this project. So I wanted to introduce her here. And when I did, Sean said, oh yeah, Boethius, Constellation of Philosophy. So we'll keep, you know, we've introduced some themes today and some some topoi, some ideas that we want to keep developing with you as we select our passages. You know, we have sort of a roadmap, but we may change it based on what you guys are interested in. And again, where the ideas take us, because I think that's what Shakespeare is doing in this passage. Uh, I don't think he was planning to write 37 lines or whatever it is. I think he got started and he couldn't stop. And and his ideas just kept, his brain was seething, <laughs> right? His, his brain was bubbling up with ideas about the imagination. Um, uh, Julie, we have a request that you put your email address in the chat. Um, I, I wanna circle back to this uh, hard question, comment that Kathleen B puts to us. She says, I'm not sure what we're, how what we're learning applies to how we may, if we wish, live like Shakespeare. So I, I think that is, you know, that is the stimulating question of this whole series for me and Julia, what it would mean to live like Shakespeare. And we're playing a little bit here with the title of a recent and very good book, How to Think Like Shakespeare by Scott Newstock. Um, and I, I think, you know, the question, that if I were sitting in your positions and I heard had just heard what Julia showed us uh, about uh, uh, Theseus's account of the imagination, I would be asking, um, how we should feel about that account, right? Um, what kind of capacity, what kind of faculty is the imagination? And um, is it ultimately a capacity that we can assume um, will lead us to the good life, to ethical behavior, to um, right treatment of other people? I mean, there is a way in which Theseus's um, account of it suggests that it is a faculty that it's not quite in our control. Right, even though it unleashes these creative powers, even though it has these world-making capacities by virtue of altering perception, it isn't entirely clear that it is something that contributes to um, peaceful, decent, happy <laughs> relationships with with other people. So, Julia, what do you what do you think about that? I mean, to what extent is the the account of um, imagination being offered here? Uh, partly an attempt to acknowledge that there's something unruly, something uh, risky, something dangerous about it. Yeah, well, again, I think it's a kind of an argument, counter argument, internal dialogue that Shakespeare is having about the powers and dangers of the imagination. And I think the relationship of, of apprehension to comprehension to you know, the, the need for deliberation and reason, uh, the, the need to sometimes not be so hot, so seething in our judgments. So I feel like there's a lot there that Shakespeare is thinking about that are relevant to how we think, act, judge, love in our lives. And then I think, you know, when Hippolyta talks about constancy, constancy is a really interesting virtue that, you know, it's not a word that we use much anymore. It's a very Renaissance word. And it literally means to stand with, con stans, and to stand with someone or something, an idea, an experience, when it's challenging to do so, when that idea or person or experience is changing, uh, is not meeting our expectations. Uh, so I think constancy for me is a very interesting 
virtue to consider in our lives. And, and this play is going to culminate in a, another theatrical performance, the play of the Rude Mechanicals, if you know Midsummer Night's Dream, in which the top and the bottom of Athenian society are sort of combined together as an audience. And, um, you know, Julie is right, the play is, is asking something there about um, the capacity of the theater as a supreme act of the imagination, right? To uh, combine different sorts of people into uh, a single experience and to have the outcome of that experience be something like social cohesion, right? Rather than, rather than chaos. And this play ends with, you know, uh, what is it? Three marriages and three marriage beds. So everything seem, and the fairies dancing around. So it, it seems to be headed in the right direction. Um, but other plays that we'll look at this during the series, including the tragedies most prominently, will not adopt the same view of theater necessarily, nor um, adopt the same optimism about um, uh, the way that the imagination um, uh, conceives of other people uh, in relation to the self. So um, it's part, any, I mean, I, I think one of, the, um, th one of the things that distinguishes 19th century, early 20th century criticism of Shakespeare is that it, it's drawn like a magnet to passages like the one we're talking about today. Um, it, it seeks for something like a theoretical statement on Shakespeare's part about the way his plays work or what he really thinks. And then it extracts that text um, from the play and presents it often in anthology form or as part of an argument um, as a fully authoritative and um, unimpeachable statement. But um, so we're doing that a little bit. We're extracting these passages from the plays and um, inviting you all to think with us about them as having a kind of portable meaning, right, um, in relation to your own lived experience. But I think both Julia and I feel that ultimately the uh, a full appreciation of what's going on in any passage in Shakespeare is dependent on the context of the play in which it's embedded, as well as its relationship to similar moments in other plays, as well as its relationship to similar moments in Shakespeare's very wide reading. So think of these passages that we're offering you as sort of pinpricks into a, a, a vista that lies just beyond, which includes all of those things I just, I just mentioned. Mm -hmm.